Okay. So welcome to episode six of the Breaking Bio Podcast. Today is Thursday, October 4th, and everybody else can shut up about the date. And uh, I'm your host, Stephen Hamblin, from the University of New South Wales. I've got a motley crew with me today. We could use that joke before, but who cares? So, Raphael, you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Raphael, PhD student at the University of Akron. And Morgan? Hi, I'm Morgan Jackson. I'm an entomologist and PhD student at the University of Guelph in Canada. Excellent job. And Michael? Hello, I'm Michael Hawks. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter. Who will be grilling mercilessly about that today. And finally, Buck. Hi, I'm Buck Girl. Four out of five isn't bad. And, oh, and, yeah, and uh, so I got my PhD before any of you were probably born in entomology. <laughs> And uh, I'm now an evil administrator at an untamed university in Connecticut. Well, let's say uh, hello to our new on-air host, Michael. And uh, Michael, why don't you tell us a bit about your PhD and what you're doing right now? Uh, so my PhD is kind of a new program set up by the BBSRC in the UK, where yeah. the first year is kind of like a master's degree, or at least a UK master's degree where I do two lab rotations, one with non-PhD supervisors and one with my PhD supervisors, and do some master's modules from the university. The goal of which is to try and get an interdisciplinary uh, grounding for the PhD before you go and actually start doing your main research work. So at the moment, I'm attempting to do some bioinformatics and some comparative bacterial genomic stuff. Uh, but my main PhD research is uh, the genetics and mechanism of insecticide resistance in Drosophila and Melanogaster um, to do with sexual conflict and transposable elements. We've got a cool little system where there's a hierarchy of about five or so transposable elements that are inserting within one another and they have sex-specific effects, antagonistic effects, where males become really sluggish and poor competitors, whereas females start packing more RNA into, RNA into their eggs and make them a lot more viable. So I'm trying to find out where those sex-specific effect, sex specific effects come from and how they might influence the spread of resistance through populations with different genetic backgrounds. Because that's the plan to start with. I don't know what's going to develop. We're only a weekend at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, uh, and we, can we get the lay summary for the people in the crowd who aren't evolutionary biologists? I'm putting insecticide on flies and seeing how well they live. Excellent. <laughs> I can't and you said it's, it's funded, by the, funded by the funded by BBC or something like that. BBSRC. So I oh, oh okay. this, this may <laughs> be wrong. It's the British Biotechnology and Science Research Council. I think that's what it stands for. I should probably okay. know considering they're giving me money to do research. <laughs> it would have been cooler if it was the BBC. Yeah, I'd, I'd be quite impressed if it was the BBC. <laughs> Making a documentary oh, out of your PhD would be pretty sweet. You just have David Attenborough over your shoulder the entire time, just narrating exactly <laughs> what you're doing. Everywhere. Michael is now using a pipe hat. <laughs> the majestic Rosophila. <laughs> so, are you I'm the first the cohort in this program? Yeah, um, I think they might have been set up in other places in the country, but this is the first. Uh, cohort for the Southwest Doctoral Training Partnership, it's called. So it's a partnership between Bristol, Bath, Nexter, three big universities in the Southwest of England. Mm -hmm. And so there's five of us at Exeter starting this year. We're the guinea pigs, essentially. <laughs> Did anything specific prompt the creation of this program? Um, I would imagine, I mean, I can't say if it's certain because I'm, I, I don't know, but I'd imagine it's probably to do with that. Uh, one and a uh, requirement to try and make better PhD graduates because um, a big aim of the of the program is to kind of develop interdisciplinary researchers who are familiar with a lot of techniques and fields before they start their main research but also because of the funding changes in the UK recently um, I'm not sure how aware of you guys are of the funding situation in the UK but a lot of the research councils specifically uh, NERC who fund a lot of uh, biology and ecology type research 
have cut back essentially all of their master's funding to focus on PhD um, students. Mm. So I think it's kind of like a strategic um, plan to kind of wrap master's degrees into PhDs. So mm. they're getting more um, applicants into PhD programs out of undergrad. Right. That that parallels a lot of what's going on here in the States, where the master's is just slowly being strangled to death. Um, it's be, it, because everybody's really pressured to go straight into a PhD and just skip the master's altogether. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the other guys here can t talk about whether they're, my perception and theirs matches up, but a lot of people feel like the master's is a consolation prize. And if you just get a master's, then you're, you know, you, you weren't good enough to go all the way. Yeah. Um, and from a student development point of view, I think a master's is really awesome because it gives you a year or two to kind of sort things out and get used to graduate school and get used to graduate study and get used to the major change between undergraduate and graduate. Um, <laughs> It makes sense to me as somebody who recently completed their master's, well, recently as in a year ago, and then came back for more punishment as a PhD. Um, I can tell you matter of factly that I would not have been ready for a PhD coming out of my master's. And that two year, well, three year plus <laughs> degree <laughs> ended up teaching me uh, a lot of what I wanted to do and how to do it. So I feel like I'm going to be a lot better prepared for my new PhD than uh, I would have been if I would just taken directly into it. I actually, I did a master's too, and it works out well for me because I did it in psych and then I switched to biology for the PhD, so I had time to, you know, figure out what I was doing. But I think you're right, Bug. <laughs> I think you're right, Bug. I think some people view it as a consolation prize, but I do think it is important. It's been jarring coming over to Australia, and Michael, you'll probably know this because their systems are the same, but, you know, the, the fact that the PhDs here are three years and mm -hmm. like yeah. basically limited to three years and they don't do master's programs at all. So mm -hmm. you come, come out of a three, possibly three year undergrad and you do a three year PhD and you're done. Right? Wow. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, I, I, I did a master's before I started my PhD and I did it in Brazil and then I came to the U S which is already, you know, very different here you go straight to the to like it's really intense competition and like i i've just finished my third year and if that was my phd i'd be i'd be done <laughs> like, it would not be a good PhD. <laughs> and, and, and that's coming with the experience of a master's you know so yeah i, I just well, can't I imagine not, going to, not having a master's and then going straight through a to a three year only PhD. Like if you're doing any field work and it goes wrong, like what, yeah. what do you do? I think you also look at the, the, the different structure within the PhD between say the Australian, US and UK systems. So for the vast majority of PhDs here, you know what your project is going in so that they'll advertise mm -hmm. the PhD with a specific project. Whereas if, correct me if I'm wrong, but in America at least, you apply to a, a program where there's some supervisors who do work you might be interested in and kind of pick a supervisor in a project and develop your research as you go? Well, kind of. I would say more often not because it's mostly grant driven right now. So, so there are places where you go in and you, you find a, uh, you're admitted to the program and they do rotations, um, which is kind of the way that, and I'm talking about PhD here. So you, you are admitted into a PhD program and then they send you through rotations through the different labs to see what projects might be of interest to you. And that's kind of how you yeah. handle that student development piece of someone coming straight from being an undergrad and transitioning. Um, so mm -hmm. they give them that kind of transitional year to sort things out and decide who they want to work with. But yeah. the majority of PhDs that I see are specific projects funded through a grant. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think they're mm -hmm sort of skewing towards a PhD is if you have three years of funding or four years of funding, um, you want to get a PhD student because that's the most bang for your buck. 
Yeah. Um, you're going to have them longer and you're going to get more research out of them than you will for a master's student. Um, so I think that just in like terms of how the structure of mine is trying to be. <laughs> There's also, I don't know how it is in the UK and in the in Australia regarding teaching load and class load. Like, do you guys have to take classes and do you have to teach classes to get money? Uh, we don't have to teach, um, but depending on your funding, you might have to demonstrate, which is essentially just being a, another person in the lab when, they're mm -hmm. doing, when the undergrads are doing lab activities so they can ask questions but i don't think you ever actually lead a class yourself okay. and then it depends on whether you have to so do it or not so you just kind of stand around and keep, it, keep well, yeah, them from blowing you themselves wait up until someone asks you a question okay. sounds like a teaching assistant sort of thing you yeah maybe, I, maybe I suppose what you call it yes so you, yeah, you, you'll mark so we would call uh, it a teaching assistant whatever here. module you get assigned yeah. to yeah yeah i don't know a teaching assistant here we we we, we take the class on our own at least yeah. in my university. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, because I was working on, uh, I was working for a faculty member that was woefully lame at getting grants. So <laughs> I taught, I taught for years and yeah, I mean, we, I was doing everything. Um, do mm. you do the, the syllabus, the grading, everything, but it, but it was a regular income. Uh, yeah. but that's, that's a 20 hour a week commitment. Yeah. Um, it's like the cheapest yeah. labor at the university you can find. <laughs> I thought that was grad students. Well, grad students that teach. <laughs> that that do, have to teach to get grad students. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> so, well, and, yeah, they and don't really hot, do that here. The hot issue there's right no... now is unionizing. Oh. So. <laughs> RTAs or RTA uh, authority is unionized, actually, in ours. And it's actually kind of a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, because if you're applying for TA ships at our university, um, there's ranking. So you get union superiority. And so if you say, if I were to apply to, to TA the, the insect diversity course and somebody who has already been TAing as a grad student for three years and so has maybe four or five TA ships under their belt, um, they would automatically be ranked ahead of me because they've had wow. union superiority over that. Um, it's actually come up a couple of times that I know of where people had to work around this and, and kind of get jigged out of these things, but, um, it's a bit of a pain in the butt and I don't, I don't really particularly like it. I don't really see, I mean, chances are if we had no union, my luck, we'd probably get screwed out of dollars an hour. So, but, uh, yeah, no, it's kind of a pain in the ass actually. In some regards. But here in the U S it's been primarily about benefits and organizing to get, um, better benefits for students and, and their dependents. Um, hmm. So at the university I used to work at, uh, the graduate students were represented by the Teamsters. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> uh, the other thing... Jimmy Hoffa? Well, you know, <laughs> if you ask somebody to work more than their 15 hours a week, then you had to talk to Vinny the Chin and <laughs> would evaluate you know, what was really going on. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was, but that movement. I mean, I actually supported the unions. It was it was a pain, and many was scary. Um, but for the most part, it was good because the students got benefits. Which I, you know, again, when I was in graduate school, walking uphill both ways in the snow with no computers, <laughs> um, we did not have anything like health insurance or or anything else. So, so it was much much better, and I think more humane for students. Well, <laughs> old timey graduate programs. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer ye oldie graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I think oh, graduate school is never going to be pleasant. Um, <laughs> it can be really fun. I mean, there are some, I had an awesome time in graduate school, but there are also moments of tremendous despair. Um, and you're, it's not a time when you're particularly financially uh, well off. Um, but it is, I think it's getting better, um, which I guess is kind of like saying, you know, <laughs> they've hardly ever hit me anymore. <laughs> um, so I, I think more interdisciplinary programs will get that idea that, no, really, we, we, we can share our toys and play together well. Um, 
These are academics you're talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they're still going to run with scissors. That's a given. <laughs> I mean, I've never, I've never heard that likened to anything but herding cats. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. It's honestly, herding cats would be easier because the cats don't stop and, and go, you, wait, you got your degree where? What? Really? <laughs> huh. That, well... I suppose they had to give it to you then. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, and, that's, and, yeah, I mean, that's brutal. And also, well, I suppose the only really good thing I could say is I don't have to pick up their poo. It, it's <laughs> poo. Not poo. So. Just the shit they leave behind afterwards, right? They, they leave me a great deal of metaphorical poo, yes. yes <laughs> I have to scoop up. Um, but that's... Oh. You know, Again, a given of academia. <laughs> I want to come yeah, see I mean, the undisclosed location at some point. <laughs> 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 Just to see the big piles of metaphorical poo. Um, well, it, it does have a dairy farm, so, so some of them are less metaphorical than others. <laughs> Egg college for the win. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I, always, distance of the farm. I always work at an ag school, so so there's always a manure lagoon, and uh, <laughs> someday they will they will dredge it and find many many people that disappeared. <laughs> All the PhD graduate students. Didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I hope not. Once they cross the chin. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And lagoon makes it sound so nice and tranquil. <laughs> but I know, isn't it a lovely name? And it is fairly nice and tranquil and smelly. Uh, but... Very, very not often disturbed, at least. Uh, well, <laughs> most of the time, yeah. I, for the most part, I mean, honestly, it's been quite a while since any fraternities have thrown anybody in because it's just oh. they know that. Yeah. So I'm just going to point out the obvious fact that. There's a whole bunch of problems with butt chugging, but they don't have a problem with people throwing <laughs> undergraduates into a manure lagoon. One of these Maybe seems to should... be a bigger problem than the other. We should probably provide some context for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might help. Although there are probably people all over the world right now going, oh my god, clicking frantically, I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so there was a student recently in, I think it was Tennessee, not sure, that was hospitalized for butt chugging, which is where you, you basically pour large quantities of alcohol into your anus because then it's absorbed directly into your bloodstream and you don't have the liver wasting anything. Um, and so there's been a great deal of discussion in academia, which is one of the things I love about academia. <laughs> <laughs> things will happen that never in a million years could I possibly have imagined that I would have a conversation with someone about butt chugging and risk assessment. <laughs> there, the there some risk days, assessment of butt chugging. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there's there's some days you get done and you're just like, well, that was interesting. I can just imagine like someone getting all getting to the meeting all serious. So today we need to deal with this risk assessment of butt chugging. <laughs> with like, the most serious face. Like this. This, this has yep. become an issue. <laughs> I am saying these words out loud. This is a real thing. The yes. obvious no, question here to me. It's, it's uncanny how like the meeting that was, yes. <laughs> I I just I have to ask though, how did how do you start but who's the first butt chugger? Who sees a bunch of alcohol and thinks, you know where that would go good? My ass. <laughs> <laughs> I think How does that become a thing? <laughs> but, I mean, it's it's basically an enema, right? Is that yes. yes, sort of a high colonic. Ha ha. <laughs> Come on, that was good. Come on. <laughs> I'm gonna blame so, uh, the anatomy students on this one, though, because I could just see them being like, "Wait a minute, if the stomach connects to the liver." <laughs> the doesn't. Sure, but, <laughs> I don't know if this was an issue, if this ever was in the news here in the U.S., but at least in Brazil, there was 
a while ago, people were really concerned because people were were taking eye shots, like vodka eye shots. Yeah, yeah, that also yeah, happens. Eye shots. Yeah. How does that so, work? So you'd you get, you know, it okay. it's crazy. Note to some, right. note to everybody listening: do not try any of these <laughs> yes, techniques don't at do all. Any of this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> not at all. They were they were having all You're these problems. You know, the kids were going blind and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> like, oh. like, you know. It's funny that we have to say this, but you know, pouring alcohol down your eye is probably not the best idea. <laughs> so it was like all over the news. And it was like, so yeah. nothing really impresses me anymore. Here in the US, it's mostly vodka that they were sticking in their eyes, which yeah. honestly, what? Um, How is that? That's got to hurt like a crazy. And this is the future leaders of our country, everyone. The strange thing is, both of those acts have been in British TV and film over the past 10 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you um, go. There's where the ideas come from. And yet, yeah, another and reason why. Was in a film called Kevin and Perry Go Large. There's a character called Eyeball Paul. He was called <laughs> Eyeball Paul because he did shots to the eye. Wow. You know, I'd, I'd like to know. So. We've discovered two of the possible routes, but what have other people tried and failed at? You know, like they're sitting there with a funnel in their belly button going, this isn't doing anything, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got shots down their or... ears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is kind of related and it's work related, but I know what about this. I can't wait to hear this one. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> As somebody who works with insects, and a lot of those insects are stored in high percentage ethanol. Oh boy! Um, oh, no, no. If, if you're de- if you sit there over an open vat of like ninety percent alcohol ethanol for like a day or a long day, and you're dealing with it, I have heard tales, and I can't say I've experienced it myself, but I've heard very reliable tales of people by the end of the day, feeling pretty drunk just by dealing with these <laughs> samples. So getting their hands wet with the ethanol, I guess, like, subcutaneous at that volume, yeah. you get a little really? bit of passing through and, and just inhaling it. But yeah, uh, apparently some people in some major research institutions that will, shall remain nameless in the old school uh, were known, well, he was also known to drink it off the side of the table. Too. <laughs> um, but <laughs> anyways, okay, there are so... tales of people actually, you know, like, so literally soaking it up and getting a little bit of a buzz at work. Wow. Examples. If you have a, um, a container full of ethanol that have had flies in it for a few months, um, they were called fly morgues at the lab I was in. After a few months, they start smelling like Christmas pudding, which is the strangest thing. <laughs> that makes sense, though. That makes sense. Probably tastes like Christmas pudding, too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. See, this is the downside of being a theoretician. I don't get to do weird <laughs> experiments you with could, lab ethanol. You could do you mathematical model modeling. Effect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to publish that paper. That's going that's going into nature for sure. <laughs> I didn't even know if that was if we could consider that off the rails or if that was completely <laughs> on topic for this podcast. Uh, <laughs> it seems pretty logical to me that we should discuss the nature of graduate school and then immediately segue to butt chugging. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should be putting. I feel like there should be a Google effect that should be putting on that. It's just that NBC PSA. The more you know. You know. <laughs> uh, so don't try so bus checking, kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nicely played. Nicely played. <laughs> With all of you listening at home, yes, we I'm discovered that there are sound effects in Google Hangouts, so <laughs> <laughs> expect more of that in the future. <laughs> Anyone who's just listening to this is going to be very confused. <laughs> and this surprises you? You may notice I oh, no, I'm sure everyone who's watching or listening is confused, but <laughs> <laughs> for different reasons. But, you know, if you if you keep casting aspersions on our podcasting ability here, you're not gonna be invited back. 
<laughs> well, let's, let's, let's just say Neil deGrasse Tyson wouldn't be running things like this. Balls, <laughs> 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 you're in your court, Hamblin. <laughs> Hold up the mug, you smug English bastard. We need our sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me you had a topic, Morgan. Yes. Well, we could move on to homework. Uh, we'll condition uh, yes. the transition from grad students into homework that doesn't <laughs> include <laughs> butt chugging and or eye chugging and or orifice. I'm so dear God, take us there. What kind of homework? So I got homework last week, and I don't know why I was the one that ended up with homework because Stephen's wife is a freaking elementary school teacher. But I got homework to figure out whether kids these days, uh, you know, learn about feathered dinosaurs and whether they think that's kind of the norm. And uh, so we were saying that feathered dinosaurs are lame, and they were like, maybe we're the only ones that are lame. So if you didn't hear it, go back and check out last week's episode. Uh, but so here's the answer. Yes, kids these days do learn about feathered dinosaurs and are actually learning that probably most of them were actually feathered and that's how they view dinosaurs nowadays. So this is straight from wow. the source. I, I spent 12 hours in a car with uh, a postdoc who's <laughs> a young father. Well, not a young, he's young and he has kids, but he's not that kind of creepy young father. Um, anyways, he's got young kids is what I'm trying to say here who are into dinosaurs <clears throat> and their books have got Books and TV shows have actually got feathered dinosaurs in them, so we can put that case to rest. We are the there you go. that don't believe in them. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the new Jurassic Park will have feathered dinosaurs when it comes out. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> if that was directed by one? George Lucas, I, I think they are. They uh, Steven Spielberg, Spielberg announced recently they were starting writing a script. I think. Um, oh dear. <laughs> uh, Brian Sweetek, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, had a post on his blog begging them to have <laughs> Yeah, Brian is pretty awesome. He's got a new book coming out soon, too, that'll be very good. But, Stephen, you actually found a book. You tweeted me my own homework. Oh. You actually found a book with feathered dinosaurs on the cover, correct? Yeah. Um, it was actually, how was it? I was in Brisbane, and there was a, a book there in the museum. I was actually there for a Egyptian mummy exhibit, uh, surprisingly. But they had a they had a book with a feather design dinosaur on the cover. I'm trying to find it, it's called Dinosaur Rocks. So, so bug back in the day, you know, yeah. you you were there, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. Dude. <laughs> hey, you will pay for that. <laughs> so we. We can talk about bug movies. So they're they're working on uh, Ant Man, which is going to have Simon Pegg in it. So that sounds promising. Huh. Although is it, it's is it the Avenger, the Avengers bug uh, Ant Man? Ant Man. Yeah. 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 Oh. The, the guy that plays pretty fast and loose with gravity. Yes, but can also talk to ants. So. And he's See, married to the Wasp, torn, right? Uh, yeah, no. although I don't know if that's really gonna, they're really gonna have that part of the story in it. Well, okay. He can talk to ants. Yes. Yeah, he has to stop for a chat, or he can like <laughs> command them to do things for him. He can command. He can command them and also chit chat. Yes. He can ask nicely. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I'm torn because from what I remember, Batman, he was incredibly lame. But Simon Pegg. <laughs> I know. Simon yeah, Pegg. Simon Pegg's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm a little concerned about the uh, number of bug people on this podcast. We're gonna have to work on that. <laughs> we'll be out number back to the true biodiversity. Yeah. Well, I'm also. Oh. I mean, I'd also say I'm a behavioral ecologist. So. Well, that that works out then. <laughs> <laughs> and my last paper was a modeling paper. So there you go. Ah, did you do the model? Uh, hell no. I had a Mac <laughs> for me. <laughs> That's what they're there for. <laughs> so we 
need to we need to model these these two insects moving around in space and time and so make that happen dude yeah so i'm guessing you get that a lot steve dude model this <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I have Dude. this awesome idea. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you do. You get people who come up and say, oh, yeah, it's totally easy to do this, right? No. No, yeah, I, really could hear, I could hear the spite in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bug, did we burn any more bridges for you this time? Are we good? Oh no! I actually, at this point, I pretty much decided to quit my job. It's it's making me crazy. So, oh. I mean, come on, seriously, can you guys see? You guys know me. Do I belong in a vice provost office? If they're talking about butt butt chugging, then I think you're probably me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's not my natural habitat. So uh, I'm not too worried. I'll move on to something else. And you I die mean, you your, your blog as well, right? Do what? You die pause your blog, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm tr I'm spending most of my time right now frantically trying to get a new job. So, mm -hmm. that's so if you're I'm listening focused. right now and you happen to need somebody with experience <laughs> in a provost office, ex behavioral ecology, <laughs> entomology, and modeling with the help of a mathematician, contact Bug Girl <laughs> because she is looking for a job. A bug of many hats. <laughs> also, social media whiz. Just don't expect the lights to be on when you come into the office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, with our seven viewers, I think we'll, we'll be sure to land like a job. So you can't say we're not on the cutting edge. It's true. <laughs> Probably the yeah, first podcast a... to talk about butt chugging in academia. So... <laughs> We should write a paper. Well, let's talk about totally interdisciplinary things. Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> interdisciplinary. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> and if you'd like to be on air, please. <laughs> yes. Do you have experience with butt chugging? Let us know. <laughs> no, no. Or perhaps a large novelty mug. No. 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 <laughs> That's a very bad idea. Wow. Well, just remember what. Remember what happened to me with the pubic lace, okay? It's true. And now I'm going to have to explain that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right okay, yes, that, that would be most appropriate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, uh, I wrote something about pubic lace online, and the people mailed me pubic lace, which, which I then wow. destroyed. So, How did people mail, like, actual, like, slug mail? Like, physical <laughs> mail? It was snail lace mail, yes. <laughs> that wow. is very Just scary. An envelope? <laughs> <laughs> an envelope and a baggie. And uh, give me a second and I can give you, well, yeah, just uh, if you just Google, I have pubic lace in my mailbox. That will probably <laughs> Google it. <laughs> That's the best Google That's, search ever. That is not a euphemism. Not a euphemism, okay? <laughs> that that so Google search find is that not search redirecting to their blog and be really confused. <laughs> um, yeah, no, check into the cubic lice in the mail. That's breaking yes. bio. Well, they were purchased on the internet. Where else? So, yeah. What? They were purchased um, on the internet? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. You can buy <laughs> pubic lice online and have yeah. them delivered to someone's house. Yes. So you, you can, like, gift someone a pubic lice on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually... Well, it's going on my wish list. list. <laughs> this is a gift. Griff, gift wrap it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a... Uh, what I guess you could call a pubic lice sting operation. <laughs> um, what is it, a date line? line? <laughs> yes! yes. Date line oh, to catch date. a pubic There's lice. There's got to be a good sound <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> um, this is the most they... surreal thing I've ever heard. So, <laughs> so, so one, of the, one of my projects that I'm hoping to have time for, uh, right. now that I've, I've Sloughed off blogging for a while is following up on this because I bought forty bucks worth of pubic lice in <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
and and it was never delivered. And so now I get to call Visa and explain to them <laughs> that uh, I my you know I need a refund because I didn't get to the place. I, I am predicting comedy gold. <laughs> uh, oh, for the <laughs> love of God! Recorded. I I I may be confused. Did someone send you cubic lines? And that wasn't enough. <laughs> no, I, I tried to buy them. And actually, it's a UK firm, which is kind of the problem. So it makes it difficult. But they were supposed to FedEx them. So it would be okay that it was transatlantic. <laughs> so how much does 40 bucks get you? A hundred lice. Sorry? A hundred pubic. A hundred crabs, basically. A hundred pubic <laughs> So I'm I'm kind of scared of asking this, but like, what's, no, what's I don't the really actual? Like that. I don't really no, no, like no, no, that. no, no. I just wanted to know if it was, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that that that's my question. Like, what's the actual purpose of this website? Like, the, the, well, I, I don't want to give you the name of the place that I'm, you know, to my expose on. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we don't want to spoil next week's sponsor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But essentially, the the first batch that I got, they were they. It was a site called Love Bugs, and it was a fetish. Oh thing. <laughs> really? And yes. Oh, oh, it was awesome. Honestly, the the guy that ran the site, right? He called himself Lice Lice Baby Vanilla Lice. <laughs> 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 um, and. And it was a fetish. And the best, the tag, this was the best part, the tagline of the site. It's like sea monkeys in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> There's a rule. <laughs> I've forgotten what it's called uh, about the internet that states. Rule 42. 42. No, 40, if you can imagine, actually, it's 42, 43. you can imagine a fetish, yep. it exists yeah. somewhere on the internet. Yes, there does. Yes. So that was the first. So the first group was a fetish, and the second batch, and there there are two different sites that sell them that, that are for revenge. And so the idea is that you get them and you have mm -hmm. um, makeup sex with oh, your that's ex. Awesome. I know, is it horrible? <laughs> well, that's. That's why I want to nail this asshole because if he's really selling crabs, no, you he don't want to nail this asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you, you kids, I mean, you've got the lingo slang stuff, man. Uh, we need to see the perpetrator uh, arrested. He is in fact selling contraband pubic lice, uh, and if he isn't selling. Uh, Contraband pubic lice, then um, it's going to make a really awesome story. So that's all good. <laughs> Did you say there was more than one website? Yes. <laughs> I think that's that no monopoly. On I like that. Lice. But not only is there a website that sells pubic lice, there's a healthy market of websites. <laughs> 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 right. oh Just because one of them wasn't delivering, so somebody had to step up, I yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> Bug, please. There's a void in for, the crab market. Please. Yeah, we're going to need a This has to be a Dateline thing, right? Like, you have to <laughs> have to invite them us. in and then chase them down the street with the camera. Go <laughs> like, screaming, well, are you I, selling contraband cubic lice? Show us your crabs. Show us your crabs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this if I amazing. can get another job so I can afford a trip to the UK, I will totally do that. So I have a couple <laughs> of people I know would, would be happy to help out with that. Dude, we should kickstart that. Yeah. Like, we should... <laughs> like, I'm telling you, this is, I, I would put my money on if you see that. Like, I would love to see that. Well, what would the bonuses be? Like, contribute yeah. 20 bucks, get your own cubic lice? <laughs> yeah. It could be like a... A very it's sort of an intaglio print, you know, of, of a bush with lights or something. Like <laughs> I mean, something arty though. Something arty. That's the Kickstarter. You gotta something with taste. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very tasteful. Very tasteful. Oh. Um, yeah. So we should. I actually did a whole story about my adventures 
with purchasing lice online at Science Online last year. Um, it was kind of popular. <laughs> it was awesome. I, can see that. <laughs> I was just watching the Twitter feed of it happening, and my entire Twitter <laughs> stream just melted down in the sea of oh my god, crabs! It was <laughs> <laughs> all the big name science communicators were just like, "What the hell?" <laughs> no, seriously, just that was all at once, the and best, then I was like, "Oh, fuck girl, best part fuck of girls it, online." Man. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, we're sitting right in front of me. You know, I've got. David Dobbs, I've got Carl Zimmer, I've got Ed Young. Um, I can't remember her name, but she wrote the Poisoner's Bible. Uh, dang it, Deborah Bloom. And uh, so all of these amazing authors are sitting on the table right smack in front of me, and I'm talking about crabs, and their faces are just like. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good if you manage Carl Zimmer, the author of Parasite Rex, to come up with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Yeah, okay. Um, we tried to end it before, but I think I think Peter um, Glass is a good note to go out on. Yes, let's let's. let's uh, well, that was episode six of the Breaking Bio podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining me, Bug, Michael, Morgan, Raphael, and we'll see you all next time when we talk about pubic glass and body waxing. <laughs> <laughs> Say goodbye to the people. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> 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 <laughs>